particular module, we're going to go through a few things around the pharmacology of these medications that are typically used and the only ones approved for medication-assisted treatment of opiate use problems. Um, and we're going to look at them contrasting the pharmacologic features features of methadone, buprenorphine, and naloxone. We'll describe the efficacy of these various products and identify substances that potentially could have dangerous interactions. So methadone has been available the longest, and this is a synthetic opioid that occurs in both the R and S and nanciomeric form uh, with all its activities due to the R methadone. It was first discovered in 1937 and received uh, FDA approval in uh, 1947 for the treatment of pain and coughing. It's a very effective pain medication. Um, and then in 1970, as re was reviewed in module one, it was approved for um, supervised withdrawal. So as a medication to help ease the withdrawal from, from other opioids or even methadone. And then in 1973, we had the introduction of methadone as a opiate maintenance therapy uh, for people with opiate use disorder. It's metabolized in the, in the liver and it's uh, and by intestinal uh, uh, cytochrome, C, cytochrome uh, 3A4. Um, and most <clears throat> methadone is ultimately excreted in the biliary tract but small fractions enter the urine and are detectable in urine drug testings. Again, it is a, it is a synthetic, so you're not going to pick it up in urine drug testing for opioids, or for, you know, for a standard opiate screen. Um, you have to ask for methadone specifically. The oral bioavailability uh, when swallowed is quite variable between 36 and 100%. So major features of buprenorphine is one, we're going to refer to full agonist, partial agonist, and antagonist. Methadone is a full, ag full agonist, um, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. It's very long acting. Uh, the half-life is between 15 and 60 hours. This is in part because of the active metabolites. It has a weak affinity, however, to the mu receptor, so the potential that it displaces other other opioids, and in particular, in comparison to methadone, excuse me, compared to buprenorphine or naltrexone, it's uh, it's much weaker. Um, and but it can be dis displaced by those partial agonists or antagonists, um, and and therefore it would precipitate withdrawal. And again, I'm going to explain this in a moment. It does take constant monitoring secondary to the effect that it has on the res on respiratory depression and also QT interval prolongation. So it's something that we want to be careful about in prescribing to someone that has a history of either QT prolongation or, or heart disease, arrhythmia in some way, you would want to check that out, even family history. So here you have the full opiate agonist. That is, the more that you give, the more the effect that it has up to the place where it essentially causes uh, respiratory suppression and actually changes the effect of rising CO2 levels on the medullary respiratory center, resulting in essentially asphyxiation. So it no longer is, is responding the way that it normally would and a person just stops breathing compared to an antagonist that really has no particular no intrinsic activity on the uh, opioid receptor. It attaches and blocks it, and I'll go over that in a moment. And buprenorphine, which which uh, has intrinsic activity up to around 40% um, and then tapers off. And so it has this ceiling effect that's often uh, talked about. So in that buprenorphine has a higher affinity to the full move receptor, uh, there's no uh, higher affinity compared to the full moon receptor. If buprenorphine is given at a place where it's up in this range above buprenorphine, uh, uh, then it would precipitously take a patient down to that level of, uh, of activation that is buprenorphine, and they would feel as if they're going into withdrawal. Now, they don't go into full withdrawal, but they start to have those symptoms, and it 
reminds them of times potentially when they did go into full withdrawal and they, they feel sick. They don't like the experience. So buprenorphine is a semi-synthetic uh, analog of thebane, which is a precursor to, uh, to morphine. And it was approved by the FDA in 2002 as a Schedule Three medication for the treatment of opiate use disorders. It's metabolized in the liver, mainly by cytochrome uh, P453A4, and, ha and has less act uh, a less active metabolite, nor buprenorphine, which is important to remember because we can sometimes have a better sense of how a patient's taking their medication by getting both buprenorphine and norbuprenorphine levels. So if a patient just put a little buprenorphine in their tox screen to, to attempt to show that they're taking their medication when they're not, they obviously would not have the metabolite. So it is something that we do use sometimes clinically, but in terms of it being a, an active metabolite, it's, it's, it's significantly less active than buprenorphine. Most buprenorphine is, uh, is uh, ultimately excreted in the biliary tract, but small amounts, again, enter the urine, so it is detectable on urine drug screening. That, again, would need to be asked for. Now, there are a radioimmune assay tests that you can use, so point-of-care testing, and detect buprenorphine, but otherwise you would need to get a confirmatory, or, or you're not going to see it show up as an opiate. Because of the extensive first pass metabolism, buprenorphine has low uh, oral bioavailability when swallowed, so significantly less, and, um, and so therapeutic formulations use other routes. The most common route that we know about uh, or that is used and the first one uh, made available to us was the sublingual administration. Um, and and the bioavailability there is about 30% of, of, um, of the medication that the patient actually takes. So here you see, again, it's a partial agonist. Um, it comparatively has less respiratory suppression. Um, and there's no evidence in an adult that it results in respiratory arrest uh, when used as prescribed. Um, so it, um, I'll show you that in, in a graph in just a moment. It is very long acting, uh, 24 to 36 hours. So there are um, ways and there's been research. I was involved in some research trials at Yale in the 90s where we actually administered the medications three times a week. Um, so we did it on site uh, and it was doses large enough to hold patients for uh, 48 to 72 hours. <clears throat> the affinity is also very high with this medication, um, and so it blocks other opioids. So once this is on board and there's a you know, full therapeutic dose, uh, patients can't take other medications and get much of an effect out of them. Now there's some caveats to that, particularly as we uh, talk about pain later, but in terms of anal, uh, excuse me, in terms of euphoric effects, if they were to use heroin on top of buprenorphine you know, within the first, you know, while buprenorphine is at a therapeutic dose, they're not going to get any uh, significant uh, euphoric effect from the drug, from the heroin, um, and because it, it displaces them, as I said before. So here, if you have a full opiate agonist on board and you give buprenorphine, it bumps the buprenorphine because of this higher affinity and, and it drops them down to this level and they would feel as if they're going into mild uh, to moderate withdrawal. Um, so it precipitates that withdrawal. It also has a slow dissociation. So this, that, the, this, uh, there's some evidence that it even is retained on the receptor for the life of the receptor around 72 hours, but um, but again, that's you know quite variable. Uh, but it it has it has this slow dissociation, which makes it a very um, good medication for what we're trying to do, and that is take the medicine typically once a day. It can be prescribed twice a day, but typically patients will find they can take it once a day. 
it holds them very nicely for that 24 hours and um, and they don't feel much in the way of fluctuation at all once they've reached a uh, therapeutic blood level. So again, it works because of this high affinity and slow dissociation in preventing uh, withdrawal symptoms. It reduces cravings. I would have you think back on my description of a drink of water. You know, they when we have when we get more and more thirsty, we think about getting water more frequently. When a person is uh, has has created an environment in their brain that's now uh, needing opioid, the longer they go without it, particularly even after withdrawal, the more they can have a stimulant, uh, various stimulants in the environment result in them wanting it more. Buprenorphine cuts that off. It results in them not, you know, feeling as if they had that drink of water. Um, and that is just no thought of it. It's not the, it's not a physical experience. It's just the thought is reduced significantly. Um, they can have a memory of a, of a, of having used, but that's very different than a craving. Um, and so it, it on top of all this, decreases the effect of other opiates. Again, that high affinity, if they use a full opiate on, on top of it, they're not gonna get that euphoric effect that they had had. But it is unlikely to block all the effects from an opiate taken after the initiation of buprenorphine because the binding to the mu receptor is a dynamic process and, um, and so there's there's variations within that mu receptor activation, and, and this in, the, the important piece there is as we go as we talk about pain later, how is it really um, how how can we uh, work how can we um, deal with pain problems that a patient might be experiencing while they're on buprenorphine. So there are various formulations now of buprenorphine. Um, we make the choice of formulation primarily, you know, I will say, you know, what's, what does the patient's insurance pay for? Because there's a few brands of buprenorphine naloxone, or which is the combination product um, compared to the mono product. Um, so there's a few brands out there. The mono product is now only available uh, for the treatment of opiate dependence as a generic. Um, it may be patient preference that they've used one product or the other, um, and they, or they had difficulty with one product, so you change to another product. There's taste differences. There's ways in which it's uh, the speed in which it's dissolved. It's different. Um, there, it, you one should keep in mind safety profile. So the um, there are products that are individually wrapped, like Suboxone film is in a foil wrapper. Subzol and Punivil also come individually uh, dosed. And this can reduce and has shown actually to reduce the potential that children would get into the medicine compared to the tablets that would come in a, in a pill bottle. And if the child got the pill bottle opened, um, can take a large amount. And in fact, this is the one uh, population that's uh, severe, been most severely affected with uh, toxicity to buprenorphine. And that is uh, infants. Uh, that have, That's the only reported death very clearly associated with just buprenorphine. Um, again, there have been deaths from buprenorphine, but this is um, uh, th there's not been a clear report of an adult dying from buprenorphine alone. It's typically when mixed with other medicines. So there are formulations, the buccal film and um, sublingual films, uh, tablets, as I said. The difference there is the tablets take a considerable amount of time to dissolve compared to the films. Uh, that is the generic tablets actually uh, the product subzol dissolves quite rapidly. And then there's uh, subdermal implants and more recently uh, uh, the availability of a depot formulation uh, that is a subcutaneous injection uh, and then slowly dissipates. Actually, the formulation is similar to the formulation of long-acting injectable naltrexone. So it's a polymer that dissolves 
over a period of time. Um, and so there's this slower dissociation uh, uh, um, absorption into the system. All of these have been approved um, um, and um, show similar efficacy in the treatment of opiate use disorders. Um, buprenorphine for transdermal or patch or intravenous um, are only available as analgesic medications. Now, there is one uh, formulation, sublingual formulation, that was approved for pain alone. It is a monoproduct, so it's buprenorphine alone, not buprenorphine uh, uh, attached to or, you know, uh, combined with naloxone. Uh, and um, this is a product called Belbuca, and it is not approved for opiate use disorder, only for pain, but it is a sublingual formulation of, available for pain. Um, so the reason that we prescribe buprenorphine with naloxone, the only reason for this is to reduce injection drug use. That's the only reason it's there. And I, I hear various things people talk about. I won't go into those other ideas to confuse you, but it is there to reduce the injection drug use of this product. Um, and, and it has shown in large naturalistic studies to reduce injection drug use of, of this product, of this medication. Um, it results as, as a result of the difference in metabolism in precipitated withdrawal if injected. Um, and the, so the, the idea is that naloxone is not well absorbed Compared to buprenorphine alone, buprenorphine um, and buprenorphine in combination with naloxone, there's been clear evidence that there's a reduction in injection drug use. Uh, and so the idea that um, adding naloxone to this product results in a difference when it's injected, but not when it's taken orally uh, or sublingually. That is, very little is absorbed sublingually, of the naloxone is absorbed sublingually uh, compared to, to buprenorphine. And so it really doesn't have much effect. I, would, I, I always say in, compare, in looking at pregnancy where we will have been uh, switching women over to the mono product, we do it on a one-to-one -one basis. And I've done it many times and there's little to no change. Uh, it's more around taste or uh, other other side effects. But when you add uh, the when and then when you go back to the combination product following the pregnancy, again, little to no change in terms of the efficacy or their feeling withdrawal or cravings or anything. Um, so very little of the naloxone is absorbed sublingually. But when it's injected, there's there is a difference, and I'll I'm going to go through that in a, in a subsequent slide. But um, it's it's important for you to understand that is the reason why naloxone is added, and it's a very important reason. One of the reasons that we stress that the that the combination product should uh, should be used really exclusively. And I know there's. There's reasons why we might use the mono product, but if at all possible, I would encourage you to use the combination product. Um, it is uh, less likely to be diverted. We know the mono product has a higher street value. There's just a variety of reasons why it really is important that people try to always use the combination product. So there are, again, these various formulations. There's uh, Suboxone, which is a combination product. They're pretty much all four to one combinations. That is, uh, four, let's say four milligrams of uh, buprenorphine to one milligram of uh, naloxone. Uh, similar with Subzol or Bunabil, different bioavailability, so there's different dosing, but it's still in a four to one combination. Um, then there's the mono product that's only available at, uh, at sublingually, generically, um, but then mono product, uh, uh, the implant and uh, 
and the injection. So these are these are now available um, uh, and have been approved by the FDA uh, for long-term maintenance of uh, patients on buprenorphine. Naltrexone treatment um, uses naltrexone as a long-acting medication that has a very high affinity to the opioid receptor, but it competes with the receptor in that it blocks the receptor from activation from any other opioid. It does have an active metabolite, um, and that also works as, a, as an antagonist. It is very effective at very low doses, so um, down to two nanograms per milliliter, um, and it at that, even at that low level continues to, to block all the effects of, of opioids. Now, Trexone tablet was approved for blockade, um, and yet the problem with an oral product has been poor compliance. So, um, so it really um, didn't work very effectively as a treatment for opiate dependence uh, because of uh, the poor compliance. People would stop taking it, and typically within 24 to 36 hours, they could uh, they could get an effect of, the, of an of a full opiate agonist. The introduction of naltrexone injectable for the treatment of opiate use disorder has had a, a better uh, efficacy secondary to the fact that we can give the, the monthly injection and then during that period of time they would uh, remain uh, blocked from using any other full opiate agonist. And, um, and this can be uh, uh, an appealing choice to patients because they don't want to be on any form of an opioid any longer, even though the stimulation of the, of the feeling of opioids is dramatically different with uh, methadone and particularly buprenorphine. But at the same time, uh, it, it often can be the choice and uh, they just know that they're completely blocked from the use of any, any other opioid. So here's our graph again. Um, this is a uh, full antagonist. Uh, so it blocks the, the uh, opioid receptor completely. Um, it, it has this then competitive binding to the receptor. It's very long acting. The half-life orally is around four hours. But again, at the doses that we give, they have protection for a good 24 hours. The um, IM injection, uh, can be five to 10 days, but again, dosing levels can fall off to very low doses, again, two nanograms per milliliter, um, and they still have protection. It has a, a very high affinity to the opiate receptor and blo therefore blocking all other opiates and displacing those that might already be on board. It would precipitate withdrawal, however, and that's the importance of having people off any opioid for uh, seven to 10 days prior to uh, the injection, we can start with low doses sooner than that orally um, and, and titrate people up to a full 50 milligram dose, which is how the oral uh, is uh, formulated. Um, and those tablets have been available since 1984 and the injection for opiate dependence uh, was made available in 2010. It, again, was available for alcohol dependence earlier than that. So the mechanism is uh, uh, therapeutic in two ways. Um, there's a behavioral mechanism that is blockading the reinforcing effects of heroin that leads to this gradual extinction of drug seeking and craving. So they just can't use so we know that when something's not available, we have less desire for it. If it's completely, completely unavailable, I sometimes describe it as liking mint chip ice cream. And if I'm sitting watching a movie and I know it's in the freezer, I might periodically think when would be a good time to pause this movie and get ice cream. Whereas if it's just not there, I start stop thinking about it. Um, and, um, you know, 
you think for a moment, you know, is, is something that you want available? If it's not available at all, you stop thinking about it. We know that in part, this is true with people that are in prison for a long period of time. They may crave it for a short period of time getting into prison, but when they're there and if there's no drug available, they, they stop craving it. They may have thoughts about using again, but they don't, they don't have the constant thought that is associated with craving. Um, the pharmacologic mechanism is that it decreases reactivity to drug conditioning cues, decreases craving, thereby minimizing the, the pathologic response uh, contributed to uh, relapse. That is, it blocks some of the endorphin release that's often associated with craving. So as we start thinking about something that we really like, we actually have uh, endorphin release, um, and that um, can be rather profound in cravings, resulting in um, significant increase uh, frequency and, and, and intensity of the craving, um, and therefore uh, uh, result in uh, people relapsing, uh, whereas naltrexone will block some of that endorphin release. It doesn't block it entirely. People still can enjoy things uh, um, and get back to a, a regular life, but that profound release that's associated with craving is reduced, and and this this is the way in which it's used and um, and is effective in the treatment of alcohol use problems. But it has a similar effect with opioids. So now Trexone has a different mechanism of action than methadone or buprenorphine, and it may be acceptable or effective for different subgroups of patients, thus helping to attract more patients into effective treatment overall. So again, some people just don't want to be in an opioid, or they um, are have a certain occupation that they can't be on buprenorphine or methadone, and consequently, now Trexone is a good alternative. Um, in terms of efficacy um, of these different products, activation uh, is full. Um, the full opiate agonist activates, uh, you know, 100%. Uh, methadone and buprenorphine, um, and um, and but with antagonist, it blocks it. So again. The re reinforcing aspects of methadone is higher than buprenorphine, but but buprenorphine is reinforcing still, and, and people need to be aware of that. There will be some withdrawal symptoms from coming off buprenorphine, but none with naltrexone. Naltrexone and naloxone, a very short-acting uh, opiate antagonist, these do not have reinforcing properties and that people are not physically dependent on them. Comparing the mechanism of action, methadone, again, is a full agonist, buprenorphine a partial agonist, naltrexone antagonist. Dosing, typically, people will stay out of withdrawal at 30 to 40 milligrams of methadone, but not until you're above 60 milligrams does it have this blocking effect. That is a reduction in the effect that a person would get using any other opiate on top of 60 milligrams of methadone. But we typically look at a therapeutic effect um, of methadone in the 80 to 100, um, and you'll often see doses at 120 or even 140. Um, buprenorphine uh, is most effective between 4 and 32 milligrams. However, at 16 milligrams, we see um, on a couple of different studies, uh, um, almost 95% uh, mu activation. Um, and so consequently, uh, rarely would you need to go above 16 milligrams. And I, I do think that's important. That's important because of some of the clinical use of buprenorphine that we'll go over later. But the more you give, the greater the potential that they'll, the patient will recognize they don't need to take this much. And then it starts getting diverted to the street. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we certainly will try to prevent. Um, so typically, um, somewhere between 4 and 16 milligrams is the therapeutic dose, and across the country, the average dose is 12 milligrams. Now, Trexone comes as a 380 milligram depot injection, and um, 
and just to reiterate the oral medication, which we sometimes will use as a bridge before starting uh, the injection and some individuals will actually take the oral, um, you know, choose the oral over the injection. Um, again, not doesn't have as good effect, but if the patient's highly motivated, it can work effectively, and it's a 50 milligram uh, pill. The advantages to methadone is that it's, um, it is only prescribed in highly structured and supervised settings. Those are opiate treatment programs or methadone centers, um, and um, and sometimes can because in part of this. Uh, if, uh, this availability or the idea that it's only uh, prescribed in uh, controlled settings um, and, and some of the medication aspects itself can be more uh, helpful to some individuals than either buprenorphine or not, uh, naltrexone. Um, buprenorphine, on the other hand, can be prescribed in the office because it has a higher safety profile and um, and so consequently, um, there's there's less risk um, in terms of it being uh, risk to the individual or risk to society um, being available. Now, Trexon, no potential uh, uh, addictive properties and and or uh, diversion risk. Um, it's it is also available as an office based uh, treatment and it's an option for individuals seeking to avoid any use of an opioid. Um, methadone needs careful monitoring um, uh, because there's a fair number of drug-drug interactions that I'll go over in a moment, and also because it does result in some QT interval prolongation. So if a patient has a history of uh, an arrhythmia or family history of arrhythmia, um, and they're there may be a uh, reason to go ahead and um, get an EKG. Um, it's, not, it's not an absolute requirement. Um, some methadone treatment programs do go ahead and get EKGs uh, before initiating buprenorphine, but again, it's not an absolute requirement. If you do get into higher doses, it, um, it may be prudent to, to, to actually go ahead and get an EKG um, but typically, we're looking at doses above 120 milligrams. Buprenorphine, there is a con concern for diversion. I will say that most of the diversion uh, that takes place of buprenorphine, and that's typically the combination product, if you're using the combination product, most of the diversion is, is sold on the street so that people can kind of refrain from using opiates for two, three days and then start using, you know, heroin or other uh, other opiate, full agonist opiates. So we know that uh, that it it does, uh, typ that's typically how it's used. And there are reports of dissolving and injecting the combination product, but uh, I'll go through why that's not, uh, not prevalent uh, uh, in an upcoming slide. Um, now, Trexon, a uh, patient does need to be off full opiate agonist for a period of time, and so it does put them at risk during that time that you're kind of waiting to get the full all the opiates out of the system before initiating it, and that can often be uh, one of the reasons that it doesn't work well, because people don't show up to get the shot because they've, they've relapsed. Um, and um, and there are also concerns around pain management uh, in that it blocks all other opioids. And so typically we would either use a non-opioid non uh, pharmacologic treatment of pain um, or in, in a surgical setting, it can be overrun uh, or overridden uh, by uh, the use of uh, potent uh, fentanyl analogs uh, typically. So if we look at the efficacy and adverse side effects of these different products, we, um, we see a variety of things. So the benefits of methadone have been retention and treatment. And I said this in an uh, earlier module, it is really how long people stay in treatment, how often they're coming back into the healthcare setting, they have an opportunity to speak with a counselor, physician, nurse, uh, 
where there's you know continued reinforcement of their remaining uh, abstinent uh, and moving forward with their lives and looking at other 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 pro problems that may uh, arise or had occurred while they were um, using uh, opioids or dependent on opioids. Um, so methadone compared to buprenorphine has been shown to be more effective, although it is somewhat dose related uh, and um, and this this study actually used uh, a, a smaller dose of buprenorphine. Um, but um, but they both have been very effective in increasing retention to treatment over time. And, and again, the longer people stay in treatment, the greater the chance that there's less other opioid use and actually less uh, other drug use if, it, you know, if, if that's continually reinforced. So looking at a large uh, Cochrane review of 31 trials, over 5,400 patients, um, comparing buprenorphine, placebo, and methadone. Buprenorphine was a, um, an effective medication in retaining people to treatment when doses were greater than two milligrams um, and there was suppression of illicit drug use at doses 16 milligrams or greater. Um, and this was based on placebo Buprenorphine also appeared to be less effective in methadone when used at these lower doses, two to six milligrams. But when um, used at fixed doses, seven milligrams or greater, there was not a difference between methadone um, uh, at doses greater than 40 milligrams. Um, and that is um, both suppression of opioids and retention to treatment. So again, they can both be very effective, but throughout these, you know, this training, you're going to hear bits and pieces, and and that is, you know, who would I want? Who would I suggest be on methadone or buprenorphine or naltrexone? So there's some variability that we'll be going through, but it's all these 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 ideas as to how I might suggest a patient um, be treated who's appropriate for my treatment and what I do in my office. Um, and that can be variable between physicians, obviously, and um, advanced placement nurses. So when we look at dosing compared to efficacy, so this was a six-week trial, fixed dose. These were patients that um, were given one milligram, which you see is not highly effective. But when we get into four milligrams, there's more and greater efficacy. Um, and eight milligrams increases that again, and 16 milligrams um, above that. So, again, you know, I just would encourage you to recognize that, first of all, you know, eight milligrams can be very effective for many patients. Um, we don't need to jump to higher doses right away. Um, typically, we'll stabilize people on 8 to 12 milligrams, and then if there's continued cravings, then we go up in the dose. Patients can all uh, stabilize their withdrawal symptoms once they reach a steady state. So typically, we, you know, I'll talk to patients about, let's, if I started them at 8 milligrams a day, they come in, you know, three to five days later, and I talk to them about their experience, they'll say, well, later in the day, I, I, I start to feel some withdrawal. I'll ask them, how, is it, how was it last night compared to you know, the first night that you took it? Oh, the first night it was more difficult. And I'll tell them then, as you reach a steady state, you'll become comfortable. People are, you know, it's a very strong, you know, high affinity medication. They're gonna become comfortable on any dose between you know four and eight milligrams, really even less than that. Obviously, people will eventually be out of withdrawal entirely if they stop opioids. Um, but uh, it's the craving that it's the craving. It's the reason that we go up on the dosing. We want to decrease that 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 wanting, that constant reminder that like I can't do anything until I get this opiate problem under better control. That's when we go up in the dose. And I think this is, you know, sort of um, 
reiterates what I just said. And here we're looking at one milligram, not highly effective, whereas the turquoise uh, a line squares is uh, four milligrams, not as suppressive immediately as compared to the A to the black triangles or the 16, the purple diamonds. But over time, they have very similar efficacy. Um, and so just, you know, to, to work with patients very closely initially, try to talk to them about how they're changing their lifestyle, what they're doing differently to get to suppress these symptoms. Uh, and, and then, uh, but over time, you know, lower doses can be really quite effective if the patient's, you know, continually coming to treatment and taking the medication as prescribed um, and, and, you know, doing some of the, some of the work. 16 milligrams will, will, if they take 16 milligrams a day, they will not be using other opioids. It's just they don't get anything out of it. Um, but if they, um, if they are compliant with treatment, uh, they will, and they can be at lower doses and still do really quite well. When we look, however, at how long a patient should be on, um, the uh, tapering, this was a study by David Pilene at Yale, um, they were on uh, 12 weeks um, uh, Excuse me. At four weeks, there was uh, there was the beginning of the taper, um, and and then as patients were tapered off, um, they those that were tapered off had um, less retention and treatment. And this was you know I described this uh, in the uh, module one. The Keiko study was very similar to this in that taking people off the medication. Um, does not, you know, keep them in treatment frequently. You know, there's there's outliers, but there's about a 10% uh, retention in treatment over a one-year period um, with uh, discontinuation of medication versus treatment. Um, and and it's just, you know, so important to keep that in mind compared to, you know, in this in this study showing greater than a 60% uh, retention and treatment um, at, a 14, at 14 weeks uh, with maintenance treatment uh, with buprenorphine. Um, so again, I think it's it, to, to not think of it as like an antibiotic that you're going to eradicate the problem with, you know, 10 days of, of medication. It's, it doesn't work that way. Um, and um, and so there's no specific time in which we maintain people on medication. There are some people that do well coming off uh, in a shorter period of time than others. And um, and it is patient specific. Um, and I really think in working closely with patients, that's that's how you make this decision. Now you may taper down on the dose, which then can reduce potential diversion and. Uh, and, and impact uh, on the on the individual, but if if they're doing well, they're continuing treatment, they're continuing to move their lives forward. Who's to say that they sh they should come off this medicine? There's certainly no evidence of that um, in the literature. So buprenorphine for the treatment of um, Prescription drug dependence. This was a large multi center uh, study. Um, showed that there was um, minimal or no um, uh, use of opioids. This was what we were looking for, and it was a successful outcome. There was um, for prescription opioid dependent patients um, a reduction in opioid use during buprenorphine treatment compared to standard medical management, and if tapered off buprenorphine, even after 12 weeks of treatment, the likelihood of unsuccessful outcome was high. Um, and that's uh, patients receiving counseling in addition to standard medical management. So I've shown you the Keiko trial, um, David Filene's trial, and now Roger Weiss's trial, all indicating that, that you know, 
12 to 14 weeks um, is, is not adequate. So certainly, you know, uh, acute withdrawal, like the CACO study, using buprenorphine over a five-day period to withdraw people, it just, it, it just doesn't work well. Um, and uh, that's with good psychotherapeutic interventions. The most common adverse effects of buprenorphine is uh, headache can be managed with um, aspirin or ibuprofen, uh, acetaminophen. Um, there's no contraindication to using these medications uh, for headache. I will say that to a degree, there can be some reduction in, uh, in headache when people are using the combination product if they allow the medication to dissolve adequately uh, and make sure that there's adequate time for buccal absorption um, and so that they get less of any kind of uh, uh, they override by naloxone and swallowing it. The other could be, and this can happen with uh, nausea that can be seen, and that is to have pa patients actually spit out the sputum uh, instead of swallowing it, uh, then they're certainly not going to get much or any uh, naloxone, um, and, uh, and sometimes the stomach irritation can, can be resolved. Constipation can happen. You encourage patients to stay well hydrated. They have less constipation than while they're on a full opiate agonist. Um, encourage patients to eat a high fiber diet um, and, um, and patients can take stool softeners or laxatives to also help this. Um, dry mouth um, can happen with any opioid. So there's a, um, a antihistamine effect um, and this can be managed again with hydr hyd good hydration and maintaining good oral hygiene. Um, one of the things that patients often come in with is uh, significant uh, problems, uh, dental problems, those that have been abusing opiates for long periods of time. Um, they sometimes think it has to do with methadone, but it really has to do with long-term uh, problems with uh, gingivitis um, and just or oral hygiene over a long period of time. And um, so it's, it's, it can be a real problem. In terms of safety, um, there's really um, negligible cognitive changes um, and there are uh, minimal psychomotor changes. The cognitive changes in part has to do with something that's um, not reviewed in this um, training entirely, but that is the to point out that buprenorphine is a kappa antagonist, so opioid kappa receptor antagonist compared to full opioid agonists that are um, that are kappa agonists, and it it can result in some uh, the antagonism of uh, of this kappa receptor is different than the agonist in that agonist will cause some reduction in motivation, some, some just sort of um, depressive symptoms. And, uh, and so when people get on buprenorphine, they often feel sort of just a clearing of that experience. They have sort of a brightening of their affect. It can be even mildly stimulated for, stimulating for some patients. Not a euphoric stimulation, but just feel like a, a weight has been lifted off them. Um, particularly some of the patients that, that I've had where they've been on high doses of pharmaceutical opioids and you convert them to buprenorphine and they just, they just feel better. They feel brighter. They have more motivation to get on with various things in their lives. But the psychomotor aspects in part has to do with the changes in respiration. And with buprenorphine, we, we actually see a reduction in the rate um, down to um, 10 or 12 uh, uh, breaths per minute, um, and um, and consequently some reduction in, in uh, oxygen and saturation. But we do not see that same uh, uncoupling of the respiratory res uh, respiratory center uh, uh, responsiveness to rising levels of CO2. Um, so. We do not know of a, an adult individual that has died from buprenorphine alone. 
know, I said that earlier. There's no clear um, evidence that fatal poisonings have taken place without patients complicating their, their treatment of buprenorphine with other sedatives. Now, Trexone uh, has also a dose response curve. This is just really how uh, the study establishing uh, the efficacy of 380 milligrams uh, of the Depo product. Um, here, you're really looking at uh, the um, retention and treatment associated with naltrexone. So there was a higher proportion of opioid patients uh, over uh, this 24-week period, um, decreased craving scores, and improvement in, in uh, retention and treatment. So again, um, opiate-free urines, decreased cravings, and retention and treatment. So clearly has um, has shown efficacy over placebo. Um, two uh, significant randomized trials that were released in the last year. Uh, one was in Norway, the other in the United States. Um, and overall findings showed that once the medication was initiated, and that's that's one of the caveats is to get people through that that abstinent period, but once they get through that and they actually get the first injection, that there was comparative efficacy between buprenorphine, uh, uh, buprenorphine and naloxone. Um, although you need to have those therapeutic levels of buprenorphine to show the similar uh, efficacy. Naltrexone uh, was more difficult to initiate due to that need to have people um, medically supervised for a period of time, you know, getting them through that, that period in which they need to be uh, abstinent. So uh, I'm going to review now the some of the potential drug-drug um, interactions that you should be aware of. There are um, more difficulties with methadone than with either buprenorphine or naltrexone. Um, methadone um, can um, inhibit, uh, excuse me, the SSRIs can inhibit the metabolism of methadone and, um, and increase blood levels. And you should be aware of that. Fluoxamine um, has, is a significant inhibitor and, and can literally uh, make changes that can be mildly dangerous. Um, and so consequently, we avoid fluoxamine in the treatment of uh, depression and, or anxiety in these patients. Carbamazepine increases metabolism, so people could have some um, feelings of mild withdrawal on starting carbamazepine, um, and um, and methadone will impair the the metabolism of tricyclics, so you can have some increase in those uh, anticholinergic effects that one sees often with the treatment of uh, depression with it or anxiety with a tricyclic. Um, you want to avoid, actually, you know, it's contraindicated that one would use a monoamine oxidase medication for the treatment of depression um, while a person's on uh, methadone. There is no drug-drug interaction of concern in using meth, uh, lithium. With buprenorphine, buprenorphine is metabolized again by the cytochrome P453A4. Um, and drugs that increase or decrease this enzyme can result in serum level changes. Um, and so those that inhibit, um, that are inhibitors of this system would increase buprenorphine and those that are inducers, that is, inc you know, increased activation of this uh, enzymatic system will decrease buprenorphine levels. Um, but Few of these interactions have been shown to be uh, uh, um, clinically um, indicated. Now, again, fluoxamine, I have seen it with that, where there be some uh, changes in buprenorphine levels that would be clinically um, indicated. But for the most part, buprenorphine has much less of drug-drug uh, interaction problems that are really, we, we understand it. Uh, pharmacologically, but we don't necessarily see much in the way of cl clinical changes. Um, 
on the other hand, um, we do want to be very careful in combining any sedative-like medications with uh, with buprenorphine. So um, there is an an, an additive uh, and and or synergistic effect um, on the central nervous system using benzodiazepines or alcohol, and it it also is more complicated interactions with opioids, um, and that is the degree of, of physiologic dependence on the user, um, and um, and this has to do with you know how you're starting um, buprenorphine and also what dose you would go to um, if the um, what dose you would go to to suppress um, opioid you know desire um, and um, and so again if patients take it on a very regular basis they will have a reduction in their cravings and they have less um, we see far less um, abuse of other opioids with buprenorphine because a, buprenorphine has that high affinity. It's really going to block, uh, for the most part, other opioid use uh, while they're taking it on a regular basis. There is some QT interval prolongation with buprenorphine, but it's um, clinically, um, uh, you know, um, there's no clinical significance to that to that association. So we we don't typically see you know a clinical problem uh, with QT intervals in the use of buprenorphine. So let me go through clearly the the uh, abuse potential. Let's say. So when we talk about diversion of buprenorphine or buprenorphine naloxone, we're talking about it in two ways. One is diversion to the street, and that is sale of buprenorphine. And the majority of that is sale uh, to defer uh, people from having to use an opiate for a day or two or three or five. Um, and you will see many patients come into treatment that have used it on the street. And they've used it uh, to be able to get to work and not worry about drug for 24 hours. Um, and so this is sometimes referred to as a therapeutic diversion. It, it, there is a certain amount of harm reduction that takes place. Um, but um, that's not obviously our goal. Our goal is to get people on, uh, taking it on a regular basis because if they're taking it for three or four days and then shooting drug for the other three or four days, they're still at significant risk of overdose and other uh, um, um, physical problems associated with injection drug use and or just using an opioid um, and uh, and then all the psychosocial problems associated. So that's that's. Um, that's diversion, the product still being used sublingually. What we're talking about here is using it um, when using it by injection. Um, and so if, um, if you use buprenorphine by injection, the monoproduct, it's going to affect the opiate receptors and people are gonna get a mild to moderate, uh, moderate actually, um, opioid effect if they inject it. Um, agonist um, added to if you're on buprenorphine and you and you take an opioid heroin, let's say on top of it, um, the buprenorphine would would displace those full agonist effects. Um, uh, or if they're on an agonist, the buprenorphine, as I showed you before, would drop them down to that buprenorphine level and precipitate some withdrawal. So it's either protective if they're on buprenorphine and they and they take an agonist, um, or it um, precipitates withdrawal if they got agonist on board. Um, buprenorphine followed by an antagonist, buprenorphine remains on the receptor, but the effects of the antagonist um, has a slower onset and will eventually precipitate some withdrawal. Um, so, so what I would say, you are going to hear about people injecting the combination product. The, the difference and the reason why it's not typically a, 
you know, the drug of choice um, is that when you inject the combination product, let's say you have no other opioid on board um, and you inject this, um, you're going to um, have, you're going to have competition between buprenorphine and naloxone. Buprenorphine actually has a higher K value than, than naloxone. So it, it's going to compete, no question. At the same time, uh, naltrexone, excuse me, naloxone, so this combination of buprenorphine and naloxone. Naloxone passes the blood brain barrier more rapidly and it slows the onset of buprenorphine. And as I said in an earlier module, it's the speed in which the drug gets to the brain that, that really encourages the, the addictive qualities of a particular drug. Um, so for these reasons, the combination product um, has been shown in large nationalist, naturalistic studies to reduce injection drug use. It's just not a highly sought after product. It's not saying you don't get some effect. And, I'm, and I, I want to be clear about that. Um, but at the same time, it has a lower street value than the monoproduct. And, um, and it has these qualities, the monoproduct has these qualities of rapid onset that um, make it more, uh, more easily diverted and, and more, there's more liking of drug uh, than the combination product. Um, and these are the reasons why we, to so encourage that people use the combination product. All right, so benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines with buprenorphine has been shown to be fatal. And these were first uh, identified or reported in the literature uh, from France in the 1990s. These were quite high doses of both buprenorphine and, and uh, benzodiazepines. And most of the reports the benzodiazepine was uh, used by injection, and but um, when they're used therapeutically, there's minimal to no respiratory effects. So part of the reason that benzodiazepines became so available and and were of you know great value to our therapeutic armamentarium for uh, the treatment of, of uh, anxiety was because it's much more safe than barbiturates. So when they became available in the 50s, um, they quickly took over because they are typically quite safe. Um, and, and, and the same is true with buprenorphine, as I've shown you. It has a ceiling effect to the respiratory uh, problems that can result from its use. But the combination in high doses can result in people having problems. We also know that just therapeutically, people that are using benzodiazepines with buprenorphine um, often are, it's associated with disinhibition and just other poly substance use, and it's just not it's it's, it's not an indicator of a person being in strong recovery. Um, so, uh, used as prescribed, however, benzodiazepines in combination with buprenorphine has been associated with more accidental injuries because of the sedation, but not other safety or treatment outcomes, okay, if it's used as prescribed. Again, this is controversial because we really try in every way possible to get people off um, benzodiazepines uh, when they're trying to be in recovery. The American Psychiatric Association has no no treatment uh, that is uh, no treatment for anxiety that indicates long-term use of the benzodiazepine. This is a whole other uh, whole other area of uh, interest and in lectures, um, but I, I really encourage people to look at other modalities for the treatment of anxiety than than having a person on um, Xanax or Clonopin every day for years and years and years. So the FDA in 2016 had a black box warning stating that these, this combination could result in uh, increased sedation and potential death, which is true if they're used, you know, outside of the way that they were prescribed. However, they put out another uh, uh, dictum in, in 2017 stating that Medication assisted treatment, however, should not be withheld if a person's on a benzodiazepine. So 
you know, my practice. And I, I, I think it's important for you to be comfortable with how you would be doing this. So if you have patients that, uh, that are on benzodiazepines that you know are, you know, caught out on their opioid pain medication or, or uh, using uh, in, uh, opioids by injection and you feel they're candid for this treatment and you're comfortable starting the treatment and then working with them as I do to try to reduce their benzodiazepine and potentially start treating their, their anxiety in a different way, that's fine. On the other hand, if you, you know, are clearly uncomfortable starting someone on buprenorphine while they're on a benzodiazepine, then don't do it. Send them to someone that could do that, would be willing to work with them and taper them down. And many times people get comfortable with using buprenorphine and they become more and more comfortable with taking on more, you know, complicated patients, which some of these patients can be. The combination use of these drugs increases the risk of serious side effects, um, but the harm caused by untreated opiate addiction can certainly outweigh those risks, okay? So that more people are going to have either increased morbidity or mortality from continued opioid use than treating people with this combination. So careful medication management by a healthcare professional can certainly reduce these risks because you're in touch with them regularly. You're hopefully tapering down the dose, maybe adding an SSRI or some other treatment for their anxiety. If in fact, on stabilization of their opiate use disorder, they don't have a significant reduction in their anxiety, which is very commonly seen. So the FDA guidance for health professionals was to take several actions, precautions, to develop a treatment plan with buprenorphine or methadone um, in combination with benzodiazepines. So educates patients about these risks, potentially taper the benzodiazepine um, um, and, um, and any other uh, CNS depressant, verify the diagnosis of patients receiving prescribed benzodiazepines or other uh, CNS depressants for anxiety or, or insomnia, and consider other treatments um, I can't tell you how many people I've been able to stabilize their opiate use, then start talking to them about good sleep hygiene, and their sleep problem resolves significantly, um, And but certainly using something other than a benzodiazepine, which are only, even the Z drugs, are only really supposed to be used for a couple of weeks, if that, to just sort of jumpstart their uh, sleep initiation. Um, along with good sleep, sleep hygiene techniques, um, and people can do very well. Recognize that patients may require medication-assisted treatment medications indefinitely, and their use should continue for as long as patients are benefiting from uh, the use. Um, and you're continually seeing those intended goals, you know, you know, movement in those intended goals. Coordinate care to ensure that Prescribers are aware of the patient's buprenorphine and, and methadone, so be in collaboration with their other treatment providers, checking the pr prescription monitoring program to see that they're not getting other controlled substances, um, and then use, use you know, drug screening. Um, and uh, we will be talking about this some in later modules, but the idea that um, you would you would understand how to how to monitor patients uh, for both their use of the medications that you're prescribing and other uh, uh, drugs that they would be getting on the street. Buprenorphine and alcohol, it's also, you know, something to be avoided. It is clearly a CNS depressant, um, and there's some evidence that treatment with buprenorphine can help reduce cravings for alcohol, um, and certainly there's um, this this potential that you are seeing them regularly, you're asking them about their lives, you can start to interact around their alcohol use. Uh, certainly, there have been patients that get their opiate problem under control and fall into uh, drinking regularly, and this is something that you want to help them avoid, obviously. Um, so alcohol use disorder is associated with higher rates of relapse to opioids. I say this in part also around cannabinoids. Any intoxicant, if they 
um, are taking it will result in their resolve being reduced to being then stimulated by their drug of choice, which is often opioids. So any you really want to be very careful about using um, or any any intoxicants that they may be using. And this is why this is this is getting into really full recovery. So again, buprenorphine does has this potential for intra, intravenous use. Um, it's estimated that that per dose tablets are more likely to be diverted than films, and the mono product is more likely than the combination product. So yes, I'm reiterating this over and over again. I, I just, uh, uh, there's very clear evidence that uh, the mono product has a greater abuse potential. So in a survey of these 4,000 patients and treatment programs um, in the United States, relative rates of diversion, um, there was um, uh, twice as many people uh, we're diverting the tablet compared to the film, and um, and six times, over six times, as many people were diverting the buprenorphine monoproduct over the combination film. So the combination product is the standard of care for general use, um, and I that's a very important uh, part of what we're describing. Again, there's. There are things that one would take into consideration in prescribing the monoproduct, but certainly not in an initiation of the, of the treatment. Um, over a long period of time, there may be reasons that you would go to the monoproduct, but for the most part, you really want to stabilize patients significantly before you would consider that. And I'm, I'm talking like a year into treatment, um, you know, significant period of time uh, before you would consider the monoproduct. There is a price difference and that's probably the biggest one of the biggest reasons why i hear uh, physicians will you know take some of their stable patients that are paying cash uh, for the product um, and move them to the mono product but um, the cost of the medication insurances will often not cover the mono product um, and the cost differential has has reduced in in recent years now trexon initiation again Official prescribing information recommends that patients would be free of, uh, of uh, any opioid for seven to ten days um, before initiation of the drug, or it will or could precipitate withdrawal. This can be very challenging. Um, Non-opioid medications for withdrawal can be used, like clonidine, an alpha-2 agonist, um, and this can be helpful in reducing any further symptoms a patient might have. We try to do non methadone or buprenorphine withdrawals so that right from the last time they take their either prescribed opioid or uh, or uh, illicit opioid, right from that day, they start into their seven to 10 day period. If you use methadone or buprenorphine for withdrawal, then you got to wait in seven to 10 days after you've started to withdraw. Inpatient and residential treatment programs where detox uh, you know, this medication-assisted withdrawal can be accomplished. This is really an ideal setting because they're in a controlled setting. They get they get both medication and psychotherapeutic in interventions that allow them to be more comfortable during the seven to ten days. And more rapid methods of naltrexone initiation are under development. You know, that is using low dose naltrexone. You know two, three, four days uh, following their last use of, of any kind of opioid, hopefully tapered down. But you can use these low doses to protect them to a degree and then um, taper up to 50 milligrams and start the medication. So treatment adherence can consequently be quite challenging, um, but it's certainly better with long-acting injectable. They do not have an opioid on board any longer when they take naltrexone. So sometimes to describe that to patients can be, you know, a little upsetting and they think that they'd be more comfortable on buprenorphine. But for the most part, it's been very successful. The oral has not been uh, so successful and it's not recommended. Um, and so the preferred formulation is a long acting and um, a treatment plan should include counseling. Um, this anticipatory anticipatory guidance that is, you know, how they're considering peace, people, places, and things, how they're changing their life in some ways. And we try to reinforce those things or get people 
um, more engaged through motivational techniques and emphasis on adherence with ongoing counseling. It is more difficult because they're not physically dependent on this as they would be on methanol and buprenorphine. So they they have less less tendency to keep coming back into treatment. And, you know, if they don't, you know, that is psychotherapeutic treatment or even relapse prevention treatment. Um, but they're also not using opioids. So it's a challenge. Um, and, you know, I, um, th it's a challenge. Involvement with a significant other may be helpful um, in supporting adherence to that monthly injection. I did this with families of adolescents. They were um, 18 to 24 years old, not necessarily adolescents, but they were living at home. And in order to continue to live at home, they had the contingency of, of getting their injection on a monthly basis for a period of time. So some patients will experience subacute withdrawal symptoms after the first injection, but that typically resolves. And um, soreness at the injection site is the most frequent uh, side effect that people will report. If it's given, um, appropriately, that is deep IM. We don't typically see that, but it is it is very important that it be not just given into the fat of the buttock. And um, so the main safety concern is really risk um, of relapse when the injection is discontinued. However, I will say, you know, people come off buprenorphine for two weeks and then they relapse. If they go back to the same dose with, well, with their loss of tolerance, the same dose of heroin that they might have been using before starting, they, they're at significant um, uh, uh, risk of, of having a problem also. Um, so people do need to be informed when they stop using that they uh, stop take, you know, taking their medication, that they um, understand that they've lost tolerance. Um, and, and once again, it's important for people to understand these things. So in summary, medication-assisted treatment is a is compromised, uh, uh, excuse me, comprised of methadone, a full opiate agonist, buprenorphine, a partial agonist, naltrexone, and antagonist. It, it occupies the receptor without activating. Ongoing treatment with medication-assisted treatment is effective at improving retention and treatment and decreasing use of illicit opioids. And in, in contrast, short-term treatment with medication-assisted treatment is tapered off after a brief period of stabilization um, is not very effective. So 90% of people will relapse in the first year if they're just acutely withdrawn using medication-assisted treatment um, in, a, in a short period of time. And that can be up to 12 weeks of treatment. Um, sustained recovery is what we're looking for. Pharmacodynamically, combination of buprenorphine and, and a uh, combination of methadone or buprenorphine with other central nervous system depressions may, depressants may increase the risk of sedation or respiratory depression and overdose. This risk is most clearly shown with benzodiazepines, particularly if used um, by injection. These are the references uh, which we'll look at and follow. Um, again, this is very strongly evidence-based treatment and uh, very effective over time. So thank you very much.